Recently, the president claimed there was a war on Thanksgiving and he would proudly defend it. But is there? Well, yes and no. If anything is attacking Thanksgiving, it is the internet, aka new facts we never had access to. Similar to how we're thinking if we should celebrate Columbus or not. For one thing, we've discovered since the beginning of the internet that Native peoples find Thanksgiving just slightly less disgusting a holiday than Columbus Day. We're also discovering pretty much all the things we were told about Thanksgiving was a lie. The story we're told is the reason we celebrate the holiday is that the Pilgrims and Puritans, something they never actually explained to us the difference in school, left England fleeing religious persecution and landed on Plymouth Rock and struggled to figure out how to eat in the New World as it was all so foreign. There were deaths on the ship, they got steered off course from northern Virginia, an actually white person population area at the time, and then once they got here, many of them starved. Samoset, and later Squanto, a native person who had been kidnapped and made a slave, found them and took pity on them, teaching them how to grow corn and other ways to get food out of the land. Chief Massasoit of the Wampanoag tribe also helped them out with game and other methods to help them stay alive. After a year of learning from their neighbors, they now had a way to thrive and survive, and so they held a feast of thanksgiving for their native hosts with turkey and pumpkin, and they all thanked God and lived happily ever after. The end. Well, first off, let's distinguish pilgrims from Puritans. Puritans, who made up one-third of the passengers on the Mayflower, were a radical sect of Christianity. They themselves were Calvinists for the most part and hated Catholics. Puritan was a slur used against them and was used against many sects. They referred to themselves as the godly, saints, professors, or children of God, and those self-aggrandizing terms I'm sure didn't help them look humble. They didn't like Anglicanism because it was still too Catholic for them and believed they needed to fight Catholicism at every turn. Unlike what is much believed, they actually promoted enjoying sex in the confines of marriage, which went counter to the Catholic idea of virginal purity even in marriage. The pilgrims, on the other hand, were two-thirds of the ship, mostly made up of people who were supposed to be indentured servants in northern Virginia and had no ties to Puritanism at all. That said, let's get to the very first myth of Thanksgiving, that they were fleeing persecution. They did flee England to get away from persecution, but they fled to the Netherlands, where religious freedom was going pretty dang strong and no one was persecuting them at all. What they were fleeing from was themselves being secularized by the culture around them, similar to why so many Christians homeschool. They don't want their kids learning things they don't believe in, which is one of the most American things I can think of. Next, when they came here, they found land and lived on it. They actually lived on an abandoned native village, which had been hit by European disease and wiped them out. Forests grew densely and scary together because the natives had been burning the place into grasslands to raise bison and deer for thousands of years, and many of the trees had lost the ability to figure out methods of ensuring they wouldn't grow too closely together and strangle each other. Without the disease that wiped out the 90-95% to 95% of North and South America, the pilgrims wouldn't have found much safe harbor at all in the New World and would have been sent packing. That said, grave robbing became a method of survival among the pilgrims to get them through the first winter. Squanto came back after escaping as a slave in Spain to find his entire tribe wiped out by disease and joined the Wampanoags. A year later, after a successful battle against the Pequots, which both the Wampanoags and pilgrims engaged in together, the natives held a feast to celebrate where they outnumbered the pilgrims two to one and brought most of the food. The pilgrims turned it into a day of rejoicing, not thanksgiving, as to the Puritans, a thanksgiving would have involved fasting and quiet prayer. A day of thanksgiving was normal in many European nations to bring the nation together after they had been through a hard time, an event that had happened already before the pilgrims showed up, including Virginia, Florida, Maine, and Texas, though two of those were under Spanish control, so they don't count. Over time, of course, the Puritan settlements of Massachusetts became religious oppressors of their own, and after a flood of migrants from other nations, jealousy and greed caused them to start witch hunts so they could steal their neighbors' lands. That said, my partner recently stopped off in Salem, which was where their highest court was at the time, and said everyone should visit. It's like Halloween year-round, and there are tons of witchy shops and museums. We also now have the Wampanoag point of view in their lore, which said that Chief Massasoit sent 90 men after seeing pilgrims engaging in musket practice in hopes of taking out their neighbors. So he sent the food as a diplomatic way to discuss peace between the groups, and carved out a 75-year peace plan, the longest of any lasting peace plan in the nation's history. After that, America kind of ignored the story of the pilgrims. 
The major states were Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York, and the rest of the country had no interest at all with such a minor incident of a group of less than 100 people, and only 30 who were fleeing religious integration. However, Americans, much like all of history, loved them some fan fiction. It's always been normal for most of reality to take a famous person and tell stories about them and teach moral lessons. Oddly, the people telling them understood that, but after literacy and printing became normalized in the 1800s and most of the 1900s, they really didn't understand this. Take George Washington in the cherry tree. This is a story the pastor who penned it knew was 100% fake, but he had a whole book about the moral George Washington, and people at the time knew it was a moral lesson and not to be taken as historic. Then people like Washington Irving would write satire, such as the Catholic Church believed the Earth was flat, which was a joke because of what they did to Galileo, and of course the Church knew it was a globe. But school teachers, just a generation later, read these books without the historical connotations and believed they were 100% historic and began teaching them as such all the way to this day. And now we get to the first national Thanksgiving, or the first yearly national Thanksgiving. Sarah Josepha Hale, a prominent writer and the woman who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb, began pushing for a national Thanksgiving holiday, something presidents had called for on occasion, and she claimed that they'd fallen away from it. It was actually from those events that we get turkey as a writing from Alexander Hamilton, which said that no one went without turkey on Thanksgiving Day. While wild turkey as well as other fowl may have been at the Massachusetts Thanksgiving, the real delicacy there was eel, along with pork, venison, rabbits, and chicken, something we also missed out on knowing. Squash, pumpkin, corn, and turnip greens were also probably served. There was also only around four women that would have attended at the time. Sarah Hale wanted it to be a yearly thing. A decade later, the story of the first Massachusetts Thanksgiving was published by Alexander Young, coining it as the first Thanksgiving and was read by Abraham Lincoln, who thought making it a national holiday was a great idea. Abraham Lincoln declared Thanksgiving as a national holiday as a way to reunify northern and southern families, which the southerners hated and viewed as propaganda. So it was literally people on the right side of history sitting down with people firmly on the wrong side of history, locked in the belief that they were right because of tradition and trying to figure out reconciliation. The holiday was only passed through Congress, much like the 13th and 14th Amendment, because the South had seceded and no longer had any power in Congress, and up till then had opposed the holiday as a way to push Yankee values on us Southern folk. So the holiday should be a day of thanksgiving to the end of slavery. The reason there is a perceived attack on Thanksgiving is because we're now being flooded with new facts thanks to the internet that historians, archaeologists, and anthropologists are digging up that go counter to the simple narrative we were taught as children. For many, especially liberals, we love new experiences and learning new things. But for many of the conservative mind, truth and facts are quantized things with absolute levels of certainty, and to question them is sacrilege and a personal attack on their identity. I remember talking to someone about the recently discovered dwarf planets, and she got irritated that scientists changed the nine planets like it was a personal attack on her now that she had to learn a new set of dwarf planets along with the new eight regular planets. Which is why conservatives are so easily triggered, in their words, by new facts calling it revisionism when it's really just setting the record straight instead of going off flawed lore. We're also now looking at things not just from the white person's perspective, which really irritates white conservatives because they feel like their own white identity is under attack from minorities when we discover white people were on the wrong side of the story and the truth was way different. But folklore too many is part of their religion and is probably in the same part of the brain as religious beliefs. And to undermine a conservative's holiday narrative into one where they weren't the heroes really is viewed as an attack on them and their childhood personally, just how dude bros are triggered, in their words, by newer movies from their childhood showing much more diversity than they used to have. During the Depression, FDR moved Thanksgiving date back a week to help increase Christmas shopping to boost the economy. People hated it, boycotted it, and it so divided families that Republicans and Democrats refused to have Thanksgiving together, so just like then, the next generation will just accept the new facts as normal, while the older people feel insulted and attacked. So the current political Thanksgiving tensions are 100% in line with the first Thanksgiving. Both the meal according to the Wampanoag, which gave them the longest peace plan in U.S. history, along with the attempted peace and healing of ties post-Civil War, and slavery where two people with destroyed ties, one with history on their side making the world even just a little more just, 
with the other side who had their tradition and therefore identity destroyed trying to find some common ground and reconciliation. So this day should actually be called Freedom and Peacemakers Day. Happy Freedom and Peacemakers Day, everyone. Let's hope we can find peace in our time before our nation is torn apart by tribalism. So thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. I'm sure there was nothing controversial about this, and everyone will happily get along in the comments section, which you can do on the YouTube version of this video, or my Facebook page, After School Democracy. Link in the show notes. Just a reminder that I'm Anubis2814 on YouTube, and I have over 500 videos on different topics that I've made over the past 10 years. Please subscribe, and if your podcast site has the option, give me a like or review. If you think what I have to say informed you, consider supporting my Patreon. I'll be doing this podcast weekly and try to get it out on the same day, so I hope to see you here next week, ready to be filled with new ideas. Take care. A big thank you goes out to Elias Garcia Guevara and Joe Taylor, who sponsor the show at $10 a month at the Wapawet level on Patreon. Please consider donating as well if you can, and thank you all for listening.